Okay, Mickey. Yeah. There we go. Good morning, everybody. Oh, hello, whatever time of day it is for you. Welcome to today's family service where we're going to have different things. But of course, the main thing is we're going to get to know Jesus better. That's right. Um, one of the things that the Lord wants us to do is to introduce our special friend to others. I have a special friend who's with me. Who's that? Jesus, because Jesus says, I will never leave you. That's right, Mickey. And it's great to know that we're never on our own. And it's always recognizing that the Lord is here with us. And I trust he's going to bless you today. And we're going to find out some things from the Old Testament and the New Testament. Remember, there are two halves in the Bible. And in a minute, I'm going to bring my friend Fred along. And we're going to have one or two quick questions. How much do you know about the Bible? Do you? Let's have it. We'll have a little quiz, an easy one. One or two harder questions just for those of you who are a bit older to see if you know them. But we'll have a bit of fun with that in a minute. But first of all, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll go into be bold, which God wants us to be. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this new day. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your presence with us. Thank you that you're alive. And thank you that we're alive. Amen. And Lord, we do ask your blessing to help us to get to know you better. Amen. Amen. Okay. Right. So we'll go um, go into a, a, a song for us. Uh, let me remember to share the screen because I often. Don't press the right buttons. Well, there's my screen. So that means we can be bold. And I'll get Fred along to join with us as well. Here we go. Be bold, be bold, be strong, be strong. For the Lord your God is with you. Be bold, be bold, be strong, be strong. For the Lord your God is with you. I am not afraid. No, no, no. I am not dismayed. Not me. For I'm walking in faith and victory. Come on and walk in faith and victory. For the Lord, your God, is with you. Be bold. Be, be bold. bold. Be strong. Be strong. For the Lord, your God, is with you. Be bold, be bold, be strong, be strong, for the Lord your God is with you. I am not afraid, no, 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 I am not dismayed, not me, for I'm walking in faith and victory. Come on and walk in faith and victory, for the Lord your God is with you. Now I want you to join in now and just come and sing it. Be bold, be, be bold, bold, be strong, be strong, for the Lord your God is with you. Be bold, be bold, be strong, be strong, for the Lord your God is with you. I am not afraid, no, 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 I am not dismayed, not me, for I'm walking in faith and victory. Come on and walk in faith and victory, for the Lord your God Be bold, be bold, be strong, strong. It's with you, be bold, be bold, be strong, be strong. For the Lord your God is with you. I am not afraid. No, no, no. I am not dismayed. Not me. For I'm walking in faith and victory. Come on, faith and victory. For the Lord your God is with you be bold be bold oh we'll come to that one in a minute uh let is come well let's do that one straight away yeah i like that one okay this is my god is so big so strong and so mighty here we go oh we don't 
Sorry, I pressed the wrong button, as I said. This is the one. Whoops. All right. The mountains are his, the river. Start from the beginning. No, excuse me, we've gone wrong. Be There we go. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. The mountains are his, the rivers are his. The stars are his handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. So big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. The mountains are his, the rivers are his, the stars are his handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. The mountains are his, the rivers are his, the stars are his handiwork too. Is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do for you. It's true. Okay. Um, well, not do that one just now. We did that last week, and let's go back to our screen. There we go. And here is Fred. Yeah, I enjoyed that song. That was good. Yes, that was a great song. God wants us to be bold and strong. And welcome, if some of you are wondering, uh, welcome to our programme, if you're just tuning in. And here we have, well, we're up. Where are we? We're up, Arthur's Seat. Arthur's Seat. Those of you will know Edinburgh, where I live. This is Arthur's Seat. It's part of what they call Holyrood Park in Edinburgh. And from where we're looking now, or sitting here, can look up down and I can see the palace, the, what they call the Queen's Palace or the King's Palace now, of course. And then there's the Scottish Parliament. And then there's what they call Dynamic Earth. And it's, well, it's a lovely place to come. And I was up here the other day, or the, well, and there's lots and lots of people. They come up in the sunshine. This is Arthur's Seat. It's a great place to visit when you come to Edinburgh in the Queen's, uh, sorry, I keep saying the Queen, the King's Park as it now is. Yeah, that's right. Well, before we have a quick look at one of our stories today, Fred, let's ask you one or two questions. Okay, now, so in the Bible, this is an easy one. There are how many, how many halves are there in the Bible? Uh, there's two halves, yes. Two halves make a whole. Yes, that's right, two halves make a whole. And do you know how many books there are in the Bible? Uh, 66. 66 books in the Bible. Altogether, there are 66 books. So, okay, those of you good at maths, if you don't know the answer, you can work out the answer on this one. If there are 39 books in the Old Testament, and there are 66 altogether. How many books in the New Testament? Uh, 20, 20, 27. That's right, 27. Okay. Uh, who built an ark? Noah, Noah, he built an ark. Yes, Noah built an ark. Now, how many people, we sing, sometimes sing the song, if you know the song that will tell you how many people were actually saved in the ark. Uh, 
Only eight were saved. That's right, only eight. There was only eight people who decided to obey God or what God had told Noah to do. Of all those people, which was really very sad. Here, here's a, this is a bit different, a, a kind of a joke. I'm not very good at telling jokes. No, I don't think so. But anyway, here's, here's a little joke. If there were eight people in the ark, when the ark rested on Mount, can you remember what the Mount was called? Uh, oh, I remember because you said, ah, a rat. That's, that's right, Ararat, Mount Ararat. Just to, uh, to help you remember, you're thinking, ah, a rat, or ah, there's a rat. So if you're thinking, ah, there's a rat, you remember Mount Ararat. Okay, here's a little kind of joke. This is the kind of joke. There were eight people in the, in the ark. Now, when Noah came out, did he come out? first or the last? When did he come out of the ark? Well, maybe it was first to let the people out, or maybe you waited to the end. Well, actually, uh, Fred, this is a little bit of a joke. He actually came fourth. What? What do you mean, fourth, fourth? Well, the Bible says he came forth out of the ark. Uh, um, Yes, yes, I'm sorry. I told you I wasn't really good at telling jokes. He came forth. Um, he, in, in other words, he came out of the ark and then he went forth. In fact, it's an old fashioned word, which the Bible in the King James Version says, he came forth out of the ark. So I'm making a bit of a joke. Yeah, well, I don't think anybody's laughing. They often don't laugh at my jokes. Anyway, let's do another couple of questions and then we'll go into our story. Okay, then, right. Um, who, which is the last book in the Old Testament? The last book. Um, last book, there's Zechariah, there's Hosea. It begins with M. Ah, Malachi, Malachi. That's right, Malachi, and you can, I think you know the last book in the New Testament and the whole Bible is what? Revelation! Revelation, that's right. First book is called Genesis in the Bible, last book is called Revelation. It's, it's interesting that the first word in the Bible is in, and the last word in the Bible is all. So it's good to say that we believe in all the Bible. The Bible is the word of God. It's inspired. It's inspired. We believe it and what it says. And that's the important thing. The Bible doesn't contain the word of God. Well, it does contain the word of God, but it is the word of God. And that's very, very important. So we're going to look at a story now. I think you like this story. It's one of my favorites. OK, let's hear it. All right, let's do that. So we'll go now into remember to share the screen with you. Let's do that. And here we have a story, one of my favorite stories from the Old Testament. Do you know, it's a wonderful how God can use everybody and he wants to use young people. He also wants to use old people. So that's why we call our meeting the family service for it. If you're two or 92, um, it's uh, God wants to use every one of us. So let's go back as we're going to see that this is about Naaman. Um, maybe when I was a kid, he used to say Naaman all the time. No, sorry, I'll try not to do little jokes. Naaman, the army general with leprosy. But mind you, that helps you to remember his name. Naaman, you know, whenever he, they brought him his uh, Weetabix or something, he used to say Naaman. Oh, dear, dear, stop it. OK, let's have a look at this incredible story. Naaman was the commander of the armies of Aram. Or sometimes it says Syria. We'll see that. I'll show you that on a map in a minute. He had won many battles and was highly regarded by his king. However, as we shall see, this brave soldier discovered he had a terrible skin disease called leprosy. 
Now, let's see, here we are. The kingdom of Aram over here was not far from the kingdom of Israel, where there was a famous prophet called Elisha lived. Elisha was a successor of another great prophet who more people know about, who was called Elijah. So there we go, like we say, the kingdom of Aram, which is really where Syria is now, and it, sometimes they called it Syria in, in those days as well. But um, here is Israel and Dothan and Samaria, where we are talking about. Now, what had happened, there had been raiders from Aram or Syria, and they had gone out and they had taken a young girl from Israel. So can you imagine you have been out there if you're a young person out with a family, you're walking down and you see these raiders coming along. I mean, obviously, we know some countries, this sort of thing is happening in, of course, in the Ukraine, where there is a war going on at the moment. And of course, the, some people from the other country would come along. And in this case, they would see this girl out and the cry would go, out, look out, the Iranians are coming, run quickly. But she didn't manage to run quick enough. And so she was caught and she was taken to Aram, our Syria, where she would probably be sold as a slave. Now, the Bible doesn't actually tell us the name of this girl, but there was no doubt as we can think about a story, she was obviously very brave because she'd be taken and then she would be sold as a slave. And if she had faith in God, which we believe she did, she must have had a, a real problem. Lord, why has this happened to me? Please help me. And she would know that God was with her despite everything. So we know that she kept her trust in God. Well, there she was taken, maybe, and we don't know how it happened to the public square. Maybe the her person who got her, the soldier, was selling her for some money. How oh, give me money for this girl, this young girl here? And I've got her back from from uh, from Israel. She'll make a good servant. Who will buy me? Who will give me a uh, thousand dollars or a thousand shekels, whatever? And then apparently, she was bought by Naaman. <coughs> Naaman came along and he was a very important man, as we said, the commander of the armies of Syria. And he thought, well, this young lady there, I'll buy her. She'll be a good servant for my wife and for my house. Well, indeed, she was. And one day she would notice that everybody maybe was talking in whispers and what's going on. And she would notice on Naaman's arm, that he had what was, what was this awful disease called leprosy. Now, leprosy was a terrible thing, because if you had leprosy, it was an illness that was infectious, and it meant if you had leprosy, then somebody else could get it. I suppose it's a bit like what we've gone through with COVID. Uh, COVID if somebody had COVID, you had to wear a mask, keep away from other people, because for a time you could pass it on to other people. And of course, there was all the different restrictions. But leprosy in those days was, was it was even worse because you'd be taken away from people. You know, if anybody came near you, you'd have to cry out, unclean, unclean, stay away, stay away, I'm unclean. And it was awful in those days. They had what they called leper colonists, leprosy faces. It was the most dreadful thing in Jesus's day as well. And Jesus often healed people who were lepers, which was wonderful. But in those days, there was no cure. Fortunately, they managed to do cures today for people. But in those days, there was no cure. But this little girl, this girl, and I, so I don't know how old she would be, but she was serving Naaman's wife and she would see how everybody was upset and distressed. Now, this girl, she could have thought, well, serves them all right because they're not God's people and they've been doing these different things, serves them right. No, no, not at all. This young girl, even though she was a captive 
and a servant away from her family, she had kept her trust in God and she had honoured the people she was working with. She would obviously done the right work, the right way. And with God's help, she had gained the trust of the household. So when she saw that people were very sad and she understood what was happening, she told Naaman's wife, she says that if only Naaman, if only Naaman would see the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. She told Naaman, Naaman's wife, about Elisha because she had known maybe she'd been there when Elisha had done one or two of his miracles. I think there were 16 he did all together. And so she had faith and belief in God's goodness that he would use Elisha to heal Naaman, which was amazing to have that faith and trust. So it appears, and this was amazing too, that because of this girl's, uh, we call it integrity and trustworthiness, he believed, they believed what she said. There was a prophet in Israel, a man in Israel who could cure me. Well, let's do it. It's worth a try because Naaman, with the leprosy, once it started to develop, he would be taken away from all the people who lose his job, lose his home and everything. So Naaman then went to the king of Aram and asked him to write a letter to the king of Israel and to go and visit him with lots of gold, silver and expensive clothing. So the king of Aram, he did this because he was probably shocked when he heard what had happened to Naaman. But because of the power of Aram, then they thought, well, they would do what we say. So off they went to the king of Israel. Now then, when the king of Israel got this letter, and this is what the letter said, the letter said, I am sending my servant Naaman to you so you may cure him of his leprosy. Now, something had gone wrong. The young girl had to go to a prophet the man of God, not to the king. And it's so important who we come to for our help. Some people, we go to the church for the help and that is very important. And some people go to lots of ones to try and help them. But it's so important for us that we know we can come to the Lord Jesus himself. The Bible explains that Jesus is the mediator between God and man. Jesus is the one who is God in earthly form, and he came into this world so that he would show his father's love for us. And of course, we know that Lord Jesus died for us. And Jesus is the one that we must come to. He is the one who forgives us our sins. He is the one who helps us as we come. So it's very important who we come to. Well, Naaman and come to the king, and the king thought, and he wasn't a very nice king. So he tore his clothes and he said, what's going on here? Am I God? Can I kill and bring people back to life again? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? He's just trying to pick a fight because the Israel was a bit scared of Iran and the power of Iran to uh, defeat them. So we thought, what am I going to do? Well, Elisha, heard what was going on in the palace. So he sent the king a message and he said, why king have you torn your robes? Send this man to me and then he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So obviously God had told Elisha what was happening in the palace. Well, the king was a bit relieved by this. He thought, Wow. So he sent Naaman, go along to Dothan, and there this man of God will show you what to do. 
So Naaman went with his horses and chariots. And I don't know if you can imagine, it's a bit like, as we're going to see in Edinburgh, is it next week, I think, there is going to be uh, big ceremonies for King Charles. And of course, when we knew that when the coronation was on, all these horses and chariots and, well, horses and carriages all came. Well, Naaman, because he was a very, very important man, it'd be like a state, uh, state occasion, all of these horses and chariots and army people would be going along. And when they got to where Elisha lived, it was just a kind of an ordinary house, pretty small, really, nothing very fancy. And then Naaman might have been surprised by that because he thought somebody as important as a man who can cure people, he must live in a big fancy house. Well, it was just an ordinary house. And when he got there, he was even more surprised because instead of Elisha coming out all dressed and his, you know, beautifully just to meet him and to bow before him, which people would, he sent a servant. He said, your servant Gehazar out. And he says, uh, the servant came, very simple. He says, okay, you have leprosy. Go and wash seven times in the River Jordan and you will be healed. Well, if that had been you, if you had this awful disease, how would you respond to it? Well, of course, anyone who's got any kind of illness, when we hear that there's a cure, uh, we'll just do what they say. If the doctors tell us, you go to the doctor and he says, this is what you must take. This is the medicine you must do. This is what you've got to do. Normally speaking, we would do what the doctors say. Well, they, uh, Elisha was like a doctor, wasn't he? But Naaman, instead of saying, oh, thank you very much, I'll go and do that then, Naaman was furious. And he said, I thought he would come out, stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and call me of my leprosy. And all the water of Israel, why can't I just go down there and be healed? Oh, I'm not doing this. This is ridiculous. You see, Naaman had a problem with his skin, with his leprosy, which is an awful thing. But he also had, as far as God was concerned, a greater problem. What was that problem? Yes, you can see it. The problem was he was too proud. Oh, pride is a killer. Pride is a dreadful thing. The Bible talks about pride being one of the worst sins in the Bible. Presumptuous sins, it called in the scripture. Pride is a dreadful thing. Why? If you spell the word pride, can you spell the word pride? P-R-I-D-E. What's the central letter of pride? That's right. The word letter I. I. In other words, I is a focus in the center of all things. Me, myself, it's what I do, what I think. It's not what God says, and it's not what God says. And so often, even in our present world, that the pride with the letter I doing what we want and not what God wants has taken over. Now that's a danger in individuals cities in nations and of course we see how pride has taken over in so many places just now and that was a problem for Naaman he was too proud too proud to do the way that he was instructed to do it and the way that God was telling him to do it so off he went but you know I am sure that young girl back over in Aram of Syria was praying and she'd be asking God that Naaman would be able to do what the prophet said, that he'd be willing to humble himself because she knew it was very important and maybe a very proud man. She knew it would have to be very difficult for him to do what Elisha said, but she loved him and she wanted him to be healed. And so as he was off in a rage, a servant came to Naaman and said, um, 
it, excuse me, sir, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? You know, for instance, if he asked you to bring all your wealth and lay it before his God and say, I dedicate all this money to God and to his work, something very special and that people can see. And, well, something very fancy, but they... No, the servant just very graciously said to them, well, how much more when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? And Naaman thought, and he realized that now his leprosy was getting worse, as we'll see in a moment. His leprosy was getting worse. He'd be taken away from all his troops and his commanders, and they were obviously getting worried about them catch themselves catching leprosy as well by now. And so, Fortunately, Naaman realized he came to his senses and he thought, I'm in a, I've got a problem here. I'm going to do what God is saying. I'm going to give it a chance, if you like. And for you and I, too, it's so important. Many of us can have problems on different levels, but it's so important to do what God says. And how do we know what God says? Well, that's why we're doing our story today. That's why we're looking at the Bible. The Bible shows us what God wants us to do. And sometimes in our heart, because God places the Bible, says eternity in our hearts. So we have an awareness of what is right and what is wrong. But the Bible shows us clearly what to do. And the Bible says, come to Jesus. Just like this little girl has said for Naaman, come to Elisha. Do what he says, because he tells you what God says. So now here we have it. Naaman went into the river and now that you could see all the leprosy all over his body. So, of course, it would be a bit embarrassing for him. And sometimes God can call us to do things that we can get embarrassed about. But he always helps us to do it when, when he asks us to do something. So there he was. He went into the river. He dipped once then twice. Three times, four times, five times. And now, because he was in the river and the water would be going all over his skin and the skin would probably be getting sore and nothing had changed. Nothing had changed. Oh, he thought this is, he thought this is hopeless. This is ridiculous. Oh, this is so embarrassing. Oh, this is dreadful. Why did I ever do this? Then the servant said, one more time, sir. One more time. So he went down a sixth time. Then a seventh time. And as he did the seventh time, scripture says his skin was healed. He came up out of the water. All the leprosy had disappeared. He probably leaped and he said, I'm healed, I'm healed. The Lord is the true God. Oh, and all the people round about will be shouting and whooping and hallelujah. And all great, great ceremony as people were giving thanks to God. Wonderful, I'm healed, I'm healed. The Lord is the true God. Well, you could imagine because now that was a lifesaver. Oh, an absolute lifesaver for Naaman. He was just so thrilled and he was so grateful because the Bible tells us that Naaman was an honorable man. Even though he'd got this problem with leprosy and the problem with pride, he was an honorable man and God had seen his heart and God was merciful. So he went. And Naaman and all the attendants went back to Elisha. Naaman told him, now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. But Elisha says, no. Surely the Lord lives for my servant. I'm not going to accept anything. No. 
because he knew God gives us a gift. We cannot buy God's priceless gift with money. We cannot earn, sorry, buy or earn salvation. The Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians, it says, for by God's grace do we, are we saved or become a Christian, that not of ourselves, nothing that we can do, no money, we can ever buy our salvation, nothing that we do, you could go to church all day and every day, three times a day, seven times a day, whatever, that will not get you into heaven. You can do all the kind of things for people that will not get into heaven because the Bible explains we've all sinned, every one of us, and we can't get to heaven in our own merits. If we did, we'd be, and if we try to do that, we're saying like, Jesus need never have died for us. That's right. You see, it's by God's gift we are saved. And Elisha wanted to know it was God's grace. It was God's free gift that had cured Naaman. And it had nothing to do with his wealth or his position or his fame or his money. It was a gift. So Naaman um, continued to try to urge him. And of course, as we know, Elisha didn't live in a very posh place. They're probably quite frugal in their lifestyle but so he continued to refuse now Naaman promised Elisha he would only worship the Lord in future and Elisha says okay go in peace but there's one little addendum if you like to this story and this is a pretty sad one and so Naaman went with all his wealth and everything back, absolutely thrilled at what God had done for him with no leprosy. So Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, followed after Naaman. And Gehazi was thinking, what is my master doing? We've already got anything. We're not eating well. I mean, we're living on basic things. All that wealth. And he's refused it. My master, he doesn't really understand economics, really. I mean, he really doesn't. I mean, I've got to do things. You know, I've got to help him out, really. Well, his motive was greed and selfishness. So he went um, after Naaman. He said, excuse me, excuse me. Uh, what is it, said Naaman? Well, Elijah sent me to say there's a two young prophets have arrived at the hill country with Ephraim. And he's telling a lie. Please give them silver and two sets of clothing. Well, Damon would give him lots more than that. And he gave, look, oh, no, 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 take this, take that, take that. <laughs> and Gehazi thought, <laughs> I'm a clever, I'm a smart guy, I really am. So he went back to the house and he hid them. He thought, OK, you could use this later on and uh, maybe go on a holiday somewhere. Elisha called him and he says, uh, Gehazi, where have you been? Well, nowhere. And he lied. Once you start lying, it's amazing how lies continue. One lie leads to another lie and there you go. And we just become known as lying. Well, Geha Elisha said, was not my spirit with you? When Naaman got down from his chariot to meet you, Elisha knew what had happened. And of course, the thing that Elisha had done was dishonor God. Because one of the main things that Elisha wanted Naaman to know that God's gift was a free gift, nothing that he could do. So now Elisha says, the leprosy, that was on Naaman is going to cling to you and your descendants forever. And immediately Gehazi's sin became leprous as white as snow, which was dreadful. But he had lied not only to, Ge to Elisha, but to God. And sadly, that's what happened. But of course, Naaman, he went away rejoicing. So let's quickly go over to our uh, memory verse today and as we do it as we come to pastor pauline here 
Let's just hear the memory verses. Yes, next time. Next, I'm on the streets of glory. Now, remember, we're up to J. That was the new one last week. Have you got it? Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will never walk in darkness. And that's why in our story of this young man who wants to go to China, he wants the people to know they don't have to walk in darkness and fear all the time because they live a terrible, it's a terrible life not knowing Jesus because you haven't got any light. So that's the new one from last week. So let's see where we are. Let's find A. Yes. A. Ask. It shall be. And it shall be given. Well, no. Ask, and that shall be given unto you. Yes. So that your joy might be full. Yes. That's right. And that's what we're talking about. Ask and receive. On the telephone to Jesus. It's about asking and telling Jesus what you need. B. Remember B? Come on. All you people are listening. What was B? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. No, that's the last set. Be bold, be strong. Yes, that's right. We sign it. The Lord thy God is with you. Be bold, be strong. We've got children. Obey your parents. Do as you're told. Then you'll live long in the land. D. Despise not prophecy. Don't despise prophecy. No, listen carefully when God speaks and you'll be successful in everything you do. E. Endure suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Because when you follow Jesus, well, the devil hates you, but you endure the suffering as a good soldier. Then F, we've got G, we've got H, let's find F. We're all out of order this week. Can you remember F? Feeding on the living bread. Feeding on the living bread, the word of God, it will feed you. Hallelujah. And now we've got G. Great. Uh, we're mixed up today. Great is the Lord. Let's find it. Yes, here we are. G. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Because he's so great, he's greatly to be praised. H. He's not here. He's risen. He's not in the tomb. He's risen from the dead. Hallelujah. And that is our great hope. Hallelujah. And I. I am the Lord, your healer. God is the great physician. A physician is a doctor. A doctor makes you better. And the best doctor is Jesus. I am the Lord who heals thee. I. And then J. Jesus said, let me get J. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you will never walk in darkness. What a wonderful promise. And so Victory Bear is going to sing a couple of more songs. Okay, well, we'll just leave them there. And uh, let's just very have a one song before we just do our final part this morning. And let's go into... Let me just do this and we will have what we've got, Fred. What shall we do? Yeah, well, there's Be Bold. We've done that one. Let's do this one. We've not this done for a while. And do you want to, we got, yeah, we've got Sally along as well. Um, this is, it's an adventure because following Jesus is an adventure. God's got exciting adventures for us. He really does. Maybe you've had exciting adventures already. But uh, it is an adventure following Jesus. And I'm sure if we follow him, there's many more adventures to come. So it goes like this. It goes, 
The chorus is la 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 It's an adventure following Jesus. It's an adventure learning of him. It's an adventure living for Jesus. It's an adventure following him. We go, let's go where he leads us. Turn away from wrong, for we know we can trust him. Yes, to help us as we go along. La 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 Okay, you ready there? I'm just getting Sally up as well. Oh, and Sally. Okay, here's Sally. Not seen Sally for a while. Hi, everybody. Okay, Fred and Sally, let's have a go and see how we can do this together. Okay, let's go. La 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 la. La 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 go for it. It's an adventure following Jesus. It's an adventure learning of him. It's an adventure living for Jesus. It's an adventure following him. Let's go where he leads us. Turn away from wrong. So we know we can trust him. Yes. To help us as we go along. La 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 Turn away from wrong, for we know we can trust him. Yes, to help us as we go along. Ready? La 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 Go on an adventure because those of you who've been following us over the last few weeks will know we've been going through the book of Acts. And we're coming now to what we call the real adventures. I mean, when we've been reading the book of Acts, we've seen incredible things how God poured out the Holy Spirit, what we call the birthday of the church and the day of Pentecost. And so there were many uh, adventures as God did. Some healing, we were put in prison, God sent angels to rescue them. And last week we heard how Peter, even after James had been killed by Herod, the church was praying all day, perhaps all night, and God sent an angel to rescue Peter. And they were, it was, it was amazing how the doors were mocked by the angel and the angel set Peter free. So those amazing things happened. Now. But there were some sad things happened. We know that Stephen, as we did the story of how Stephen was killed and Saul was there where it happened and he was agreeing to it. But then we did the story how Saul became a Christian. And uh, amazing things happened with Saul. So now after we come now to this part of the book of Acts, where the attention goes from Peter on to Saul, who is now called Paul. And we're going to go into what we call the first missionary outreach, first mission uh, that Paul did. And uh, I know I've got friends who's going out on mission. We hope to go out on mission soon, back over to Poland again. And it's so great this coming summer. To, to get away and do missions. So this is the ongoing story as we now we start with the book of Acts and we're in chapter 11 through 12 and 13, well, through 13. So after Stephen's death, many Christians were persecuted and they fled or they left Jerusalem. But wherever they went, they told other Jews about Jesus. But some who went to the place called Antioch told people who are not only Jews, but Gentiles. That means a non-Jew, you and I, 
were not a Jew, were a Gentile about Jesus. And many began to believe in Jesus. So here's Antioch. And Antioch was north of Jerusalem in Syria, similar where we've been talking about earlier in that Old Testament story. And when news of the Gentiles becoming Christians got back to Jerusalem, they went Barnabas to find out what was going on. Now, Barnabas was a, a very generous, a very, very kind person. And when he went and he began to meet these people who become Christians and he, they were not Jews, he was just so thrilled. He was just so thrilled. And it, so he began to encourage them and to encourage to bring other people to help them to become Christians too. Now, Barnabas realized, because we all have different giftings, they needed somebody to teach them. And there was no one better, he thought, than to go and find his friend Saul, now called Paul. So he traveled to where to Paul lived in a place called Tarshish. And now, as we said, he was called Paul. And you may remember as we explained the story of how Paul became a Christian. And so when Barnabas met Paul, he says, Paul, Will you come to Antioch and help these people who have just become Christians? So Paul accepted the invitation and he went with Barnabas and some others, Simeon, Lucius, Manian, teaching the new Christians how to live for God. Because when we become a Christian, it's so important. Remember, Jesus' uh, followers were called disciples. In other words, learn ones, train ones. And when we become a Christian, it's so important for us to get to know how we can serve God, which is very basically reading our Bible, praying and asking God to guide us by the Holy Spirit. So, but of course, there's more in that as well. So these team of five prophets and teachers went to Antioch and Paul stayed with them a year. Now, one day, as they were praying and worshipping God, the Holy Spirit said, I want you to lay aside, I want you to call Barnabas and Paul for the work I want them to do. Now, obviously, God had been speaking to Barnabas and Paul, giving them a, a sense that, yes, he wanted them to do something special for him or to go a place. And when the Holy Spirit spoke, maybe through as a word of prophecy, maybe there was something quickened from the scrolls about God sending his people out. Well, God spoke very clearly. And so they realized that Barnabas and Paul were to go on, we would call it now, a missionary journey. So they went again a bit more without food, because when we fast, it helps us to hear God better, to know what God wants us to do. So they laid their hands on Paul and Barnabas and sent them on the way. And a cousin of Barnabas called John Mark joined them on their travels. Now, um, whether or not they prayerfully thought that John Mark should come or John Mark just, oh, that's a good idea. I'll come with you. But anyway, for a while, he joined them and off they went. They went, first of all, from where they were to Cilicia, and then they got on a boat and they headed for Cyprus. And there it is. And they landed at this port here of Salamis on the west coast of Cyprus. And then they began to teach in the synagogues, telling people about Jesus and those who became Christians, explaining to them all about the life of Jesus and what Jesus had done. And it was, they had a great time place to place throughout the island, teaching in the synagogues and encouraging those who were Christians to be bold, to be strong, and recognizing that the Lord was with them. Well, they came to the end of the island here, a place called Paphos, where there was a Roman ruler, a proconsul called Sergius Paulus, and he lived there. Now, the proconsul, who was obviously an intelligent man, he heard what Barnabas and Saul were doing, and he wanted to hear this message to himself. But he had around him a kind of a, 
a sorcerer, a false prophet. This man was called Bar Jesus or Elimas. And he pretended to be some special person from God. He was a man who spoke God's messages. And so when Paul and Barnabas began to explain the truth of God's word to the Roman leader here, Elimus began, no, no, don't listen to them. These people are telling no lies. And, and he tried to stop them. Well, up to that point, it seemed as though the proconsul Sergius had listened to him because he was probably doing some tricks or kind of giving um, prophecies, which maybe perhaps they did come true a little bit. But of course, they were inspired by the devil rather than God. And Paul recognized that this man was not from God at all, but was from the evil one. So he says to him very boldly, he says, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right, Paul said. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. The Lord is going to make you blind for a time, unable to see the light of the sun and the Holy Spirit, just like it happened with Saul himself. He was blind for a while. We're not sure for how long, but the Lord wanted to teach him a lesson. You cannot stand against God the way you are doing. And eventually that what happens to those people who do stand against God. There will be a consequence. And so the Lord used Paul to stop this man doing his wicked things. And when the Roman leader, ruler, the proconsul saw what was happening, he became a Christian and he believed in the Lord. And it was just quite amazing. Well, after that, Paul and Barnabas and Mark left on a ship to go to Pergia to continue their travels and have many, many more adventures. And it is an adventure following Jesus. And they certainly did have exciting things happen. So we'll do a little bit more of that next week. And uh, some of the exciting things happen. But I hope that as you follow Jesus, God will guide and lead you. God has got to work for each one of us. The Bible says before the world was made, God has planned for things for us to do. Now, what has God got for you to do? Well, first of all, if you're not a Christian, the most important thing of all is to come to the Lord Jesus. Each week we explain how Jesus came, how he loves us. He took the punishment on the cross for our sins. And he calls us to come to himself. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And Jesus says that here I am. I stand at the door of your life and I knock. If you'll listen to my voice and you will open the door of your life. I will come in. And that's the good news, a free gift. God has got a place in heaven for you. But we must choose to follow him. It's always a choice. God is love, but love does not force itself on anyone. We explain what Jesus had done. He died on the cross. He took the punishment because he is the son of God, because all authority belongs to him. He was able to overcome death itself, rose from the dead. He presented his precious blood in heaven as what they call a propitiation or the means of cleansing us from our sin. And then to show that Jesus is the son of God, we know that Jesus rose and then he told the followers, follow me and I will give you my hope, the Holy Spirit. And he is the one who will dwell within you and he will show you what I want you to do. So the most important thing is to give your life to the Lord Jesus if you've never done so. That's the first step. Then the next thing is, as we become a Christian, so important for us to find a Bible, to read a Bible, to pray, to meet with other Christians, 
people who love Jesus, people who love the word of God, get fellowship, start praying together, seeing God answer prayer. All these things are very important for us all to do. But not being a bit like Naaman, his pride held him back from doing what God wanted. Don't let anything or anyone hold you back from doing what God wants you to do. What does God want you to do today? What does God want me to do? Well, it's yielding ourselves to worship, to praise him. So let's, as we close today, let's have a word of prayer together. And if you've never done so and you'd like to do this, I'm going to say a prayer about receiving Jesus. And then a prayer how we can once again yield our lives to the Lord today and ask him to fill us with his Holy Spirit. So you'd like to join us in prayer? Lord Jesus, just join with me. I ask you today to forgive me for what I have done wrong. I open my life to you. I ask you to come and live in my life. I ask you to give me more of your Holy Spirit and help me to serve and to love you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you love me. Thank you. You will never leave me. And I ask you to use me to be a true follower of you and to let other people know that you're alive. Amen. Amen. Okay. Yes, amen. Thanks, Mickey. Yes, good. Well, I hope you'll have a good week, and uh, I'll have the midnight hour this week, God willing, and I hope to see you next week. Bye for now. Bye. God bless. Bye, everybody. God bless you. God bless.